well, as Sam mentioned, <clears throat> I bring you greetings from the city of brotherly love and lots of folks there who know about you and are encouraged by what God is doing here at Loft City Church. One, just because your video stuff is unbelievable. So you have fans uh, who you've never even met who watch things and are encouraged by what God's doing here. We've watched your baptisms. And as we've seen what the Lord has done through Loft City Church, our hearts really are rooting for you and cheering for you. And we are excited for what the Lord is doing through you. So I know the gospel is real because now a converted Eagles fan is worshiping God with some Cowboys fans. And it is with great joy that I get to be here with you, as, as Pastor Sam mentioned. And he has been a really good brother to us as well. He, he works and serves you as well and as faithfully as he does. And I'm encouraged by this brother. He's a hero to me because I know if I had to preach a sermon and work a job, I would never be able to do anything and so I'm grateful for the love that he has for you and grateful sincerely to be with you this morning. As you mentioned, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount as well. And so it's a delight for me to be able to jump into a passage that we got to think through at Seven Mile Road. And so the passage we're looking at is Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. So if you've got a Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Here's what God's word says. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Okay, this is God's word to us this morning. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I remember that I was in band. They forced all the students to be in band, and so I played the saxophone. And, and played is too far of a stretch. I had a saxophone because they gave every student a saxophone, but I hated being in the band. I just didn't have a musical bone in my body, and so I, I can't clap and sing at the same time. I have no rhythm. You don't even want to see me try and dance. I just had no ability to be in band, and I hated being in band. And so week in and week out, I would forge my mom's signature saying that I had practiced when I would never practice until finally, I, I can tell you how bad I was in that we had a winter concert, and I remember that the band teacher told me uh, not to, w the, the grand finale was going to be the Eye of the Tiger. And so the teacher told me to airplay and pretend because I was just that bad and not to ruin the rest of the band by actually trying to play. I was just awful at it. And so I came up with this brilliant plan to quit band. I was going to tell the school that mom didn't want me to be in band, so I forged a letter saying, please excuse my son from being in band, wrote my mom's signature, and, and handed it to my band teacher. And now I was halfway home from this brilliant, devious plan of mine because now I had convinced school that mom didn't want me to be in band. Now I just needed to go home and convince mom that school didn't want me to be in band. And so I went home to, sh to mom and told her, uh, you know, I'm so bad at band that they kicked me out and they don't want me to be in band anymore. And I was this close to pulling away this great heist, except my mom is a cheap Indian woman, and so her immediate response, I kid you not, word for word was, they kicked you out of band, we pay school taxes. They're not going to kick you out of band. I pay taxes for you to be in the band. And so she grabbed the phone to call my teacher, and then I gushed, and I said, I'm a liar, I'm sorry, I've been lying to everybody, and it was just this, the worst thing. Now, y you know what it's like to get busted in a lie. Just getting caught in a lie is like the worst thing in the world. But what I noticed is, as I grew older, the lying didn't stop. It just got more sophisticated. I just got better at it, right? A and I think all of us would know, no, no one's supposed to be a liar. You're supposed to keep your word. W whether you're a Christian or not, in our culture, we've got... Proverbs like honesty is the best policy. We know we're not supposed to lie. A and I think most of us would say we're not liars. We may fib a little bit here and there, right? We may tell white lies, in fact. A lie is too harsh of a word, so we invented the word li white lie to kind of describe the kind of lying that we do. We, we, we stretch the truth a little bit. We spin things every now and then. I mean, who of us hasn't done that? Uh, who of us hasn't said to someone, oh, I would have loved to come to that. It's just I'll be out of town. I'll be busy. We've got some things to take care of. Who of us hasn't said, oh, I, I missed your call. That's why I didn't get back to you. And your 
three emails and your four voice messages and your two tweets. I didn't see any of them. That's why we didn't get in touch. Uh, who of us hasn't called in and said, boss, <coughs> I can't come in. I'm not feeling well. Or, or hasn't said, no, those jeans actually make you look really skinny. Skinny is how those jeans make you look. Right? All, all of us, right? Need I go on? All of us would say, uh, we know what that's like. And, and what I want you to say, see in this passage is that Jesus this morning is after the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us all God. Right? And, and I want you to hear, Jesus is not after the compulsive liar or the pathological liar. He's after the, the little fib, white liar of us. You see, what Jesus does is he casts a net big and wide enough to catch us all. In fact, that's what he's been doing throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount. As you've been listening, you see that Jesus constantly throws a net that's wide enough to catch us all. Right? So he'll talk about murder. And so everyone who's not committed murder feels like, all right, we're good. Except he throws a net wide enough to say, I'm not just talking about murder. I'm talking about anger in your relationships and any unreconciled relationships in your life. And so the net catches us all. When he talks about adultery, we go, I've never slept with anyone that's not my spouse. So we're about to wipe our brow and be proud of ourselves, except he throws a net wide enough to say, wait, wait, I'm not just talking about adultery. I'm talking about what's going on in your heart. If you've lusted, you're in the net also. And so time and time again in this great sermon, the most famous sermon Jesus preached, he throws this net wide enough to not just catch the sinners who are sinners and know it, but the religious, moral, good people who would find themselves on a church service on a Sunday morning. Right? That's what you see in Jesus' ministry over and over again. Jesus will go up to a prostitute and he'll say, your life is a mess. You're headed for destruction. You need me in your life. And the prostitute will say, you're right. How do I follow you? Jesus will go up to a moral, religious, good person who dots every I and crosses every T and says, your life is a mess. You're headed for destruction. You need me in your life. And they respond, you're wrong. How can we kill you? And so what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is he throws a net wide enough to catch all of us. In fact, that's what you've heard in the Sermon on the Mount. Sam, a few weeks ago, preached and you heard Jesus say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? Unless your way of being right and doing the right thing exceeds the religious leaders of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees, their way of doing right and being right, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus starts to draw a contrast between the Pharisee way of righteousness and Jesus' way of righteousness. There's a Pharisee way to do the right thing, and there's a Jesus way of doing the right thing. And unless your righteousness is better than the Pharisee way of doing the right thing, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. What's the Pharisee way of doing the right thing? The Pharisee way of righteousness is like, is like when mom says, don't touch your brother. You know what Pharisee righteousness does? I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. And you want to kill him, but he's what? He's technically right. Right? Y you see that, that I'm not touching you, that, that sort of he's obeying the letter of the law, but he's missed the point of the law, missed the spirit of the thing. That I'm not touching you is Pharisee righteousness. Right? Because the letter of the law is don't touch your brother. But, but that's completely different than the spirit of mom's law. The spirit of mom's law is not just don't touch your brother. It's actually please don't bother your brother. It's actually even please pursue peace. Actually live in love with your brother. But Pharisee righteousness is always this bare minimum, technicality, loophole seeking righteousness. And that's the way Pharisee righteousness is all the time. It's let me get away with what I can get away with without crossing the line where I'm zapped, where I'm punished, where I'm judged. Just enough to get by. And that's how Pharisee righteousness works with everything, right? And, and just when we're disgusted with them, we know what that's like. We know what it's like to be bare minimum, technicality, loophole-seeking righteousness. It's, it's the kind of heart that's behind, why would I give 11% when 10% is tithing? 10% is what the law requires. So why on earth would I give 11? It's, it's technicality, loophole seeking, bare minimum righteousness. And you see it throughout the Sermon on the Mount. So when Jesus talks about anger, murder, what's, what's Pharisee righteousness? It's don't kill anyone. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder. And Jesus says, wait, that's just the surface. That's the tip of the iceberg. There's this massive reality underneath. God's not just against murder. He's for life. He's for life in your relationships. And so I need to not just hear whether you killed someone, but what does your relationships with people look like? So let's talk about anger. Let's talk about your reconciled relationships. You see, underneath all the commands is not just what God's against, but a massive reality of what God's for. If you read the commands of God as just prohibitions of what he's against, you're missing the massive part of the iceberg that's underneath of what God's actually for. So when Jesus talks about adultery, the Pharisees say, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says, that's technicality righteousness. Because God's not just against adultery, he's for purity and fidelity and faithfulness. There's a massive reality of what he's for underneath what he's against, right? You, you who are parents, when you tell your kid, don't touch the stove, do you say that because you just love making commands? You love filling your home with no's and prohibitions? No, underneath that simple command is a massive reality of what you're for. You're for your kid, for him to be healthy and safe and alive. You're for him seeing five years old and not dying at three. Right? You're for him, which is what's underneath the don't touch the stove. And Jesus throughout the Sermon on the Mount is one time after another saying, if you are keeping the letter of the law and missing the spirit of it, your righteousness has not yet exceeded that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so one after another, Jesus begins to say, in all the issues of life, here's what it looks like to live out righteousness. Here's what it looks like to live in my kingdom. And this morning he speaks about speech. And he wants you to hear, here's what righteousness looks like when it comes to the words that come out of your mouth. Here is what I'm for. I'm not just against lying. I'm for truth. And so here's what Jesus says. Again, we heard it in 33 through 37. And, and a Bible teacher said this. He said, it's helpful when you study any passage to ask what, so what, and what now, right? So meaning what, what's the passage saying? What is Jesus teaching here? So what, as in what difference does it make? Why should we care? And what now? That is, what should I do with it having heard it? And so I, I think that's helpful for us to consider even with this passage. So I want to apply that to here. What is Jesus saying? So what, why does it matter? And what now, what should we do with it? Here's the first one, what? What is Jesus saying? Listen again to verse 33 and 34. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, here's Jesus, do not take an oath at all. Now, what's Jesus saying? Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read this and have thought through this, I, I found myself not knowing what Jesus was saying. I sort of scratched my head and I thought, what is Jesus against here? Is it that Jesus has a problem with promises? Is he against oaths? He just doesn't like pledges or vows. What, what is it that Jesus is so against here, right? And, and you need to know there are some Christians who have read this and interpreted it that way. And so there are Christians, for example, who won't put their hand on a Bible and take an oath. There, there are Christians who won't give an oath of allegiance, who won't join the military, and so on and so forth. And while you admire their sincere desire to obey the Scriptures, I think there's something off with that interpretation. And the reason is, because as you keep reading Matthew's gospel, you find that Jesus himself takes an oath and speaks under oath. So, for example, at the end of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is on trial, the chief priests and Pharisees who want to kill him are grilling him and asking him questions. He doesn't say a word. Like a lamb being led to the slaughter, his mouth is silent. But then you read that the high priest puts Jesus under oath. In fact, listen to it. Matthew 26, just listen to verse 63. It says, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus replied, verse 64, you have said so. So here's the scene, is that they're grilling him with questions. He doesn't say a word. But when the high priest puts him under oath, the equivalent of us putting your hand on the Bible and saying, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, then Jesus speaks under oath. You keep reading the New Testament, you find the Apostle Paul who had the Sermon on the Mount, who heard and, and was taught the Sermon on the Mount, 
also feels free to take an oath. In his letter to the Corinthians, he says, he calls God as his witness. As God is my witness, I'm telling you the truth right now. Moreover, if you flip backwards into the Old Testament, you'll find laws about oaths and vows. Let me just read you one, Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. You see, the time out. Right? The Old Testament is actually saying what the Pharisees seem to be saying, which is if you make an oath, make sure you keep your oath. And yet why is Jesus here saying, you've heard it said, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. So you scratch your head and you go, what, what is Jesus against here? Now, we've already heard in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is the one who himself said, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. He went so far as to say, not a dot, not a little iota is going to be removed from the law. And so we know Jesus has no issue with the Old Testament or with the law. What Jesus has issue with is the Pharisees' misinterpretation of the law. You see, the Pharisees were experts at doing gymnastics and origami with God's law to get it to serve what they want to do. And so what Jesus time and time again has issue with is not the law, but the Pharisees' misinterpretation of the law. You see, remember, the Pharisees were kings of technicality righteousness, loophole, bare minimum righteousness. And so you almost come to expect, what are the Pharisees trying to pull? They're always looking to pull something on God. What are they trying to do? And surprise, surprise, that's exactly what you find here. You see, what the Pharisees did was in the Old Testament, you had all these texts about vows and oaths and promises and pledges and how you were to keep them. And what the Pharisees did was they created an entire superstructure of laws and caveats and escape tunnels so that they wouldn't be held by oaths. To, to make it plain, one rabbi, he said this, he said, if you swear by Jerusalem, you're not bound by your vow. But if you swear towards Jerusalem, you're bound. You hear it? It's not just oaths, it's the escape tunnels and hatches and caveats and this entire structure around oaths so that a rabbi would say to his people, if you swear by Jerusalem, it's like crossing your fingers. It doesn't really count. But if you swear towards Jerusalem, ah, you're stuck. You've got to keep your word. And over and over again, this would happen. In fact, Jesus, later in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 23, he just lets the Pharisees have it. In 23, listen to what he says, verse 16 and following. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. You hear what Jesus is saying? You, you see what you Pharisees have done? You guys are evil geniuses, right? You have said, if you swear by the temple, cross your fingers, no big deal. If you swore by the gold on the temple, ah, oh, you guys are stuck. You want to you want to get an oath you can get out of an escape tunnel and a hatch you can walk out of then just swear by the altar because if you swore by the gift on the altar ah oh, you didn't craft your words carefully enough right and so Jesus hears this and he says you blind guides you fools right H how is it that you have taken oaths which were supposed to bind you to honesty and made it for you a vehicle to deceive do you, do you see the gymnastics and origami that the Pharisees were able to do? And Jesus says, enough. You see, in fact, oath was basically a way of saying, as God is my witness, what I'm telling you right now is true. You were invoking God, right? In God's presence, what I'm telling you is true. And so what did the Pharisees do? They said, what we need to do is we need to get God out of our oath, right? Because it's one thing if you say, here's something. And if it's another thing, if I say, I swear to God, here's something. So what did the Pharisees do? They said, let's get God out. So what did they begin to do? They said, let's swear by heaven. And let's swear by earth. Let's swear by Jerusalem. Let's swear by our head. And in all those places, God, you haven't sworn to God. But listen to what Jesus says. 
Jesus, verse 34, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Jesus comes to them and he says, what do you mean God's not there? What do you mean you're going to swear by heaven and God's not there? Heaven is God's throne. What do you mean you're going to swear by earth and God's not in that? Earth is his footstool. What do you mean you're going to swear by Jerusalem? That's his city. What do you mean you're going to swear by your head? Listen, you can't even make one hair, white or black, without God getting involved. What Jesus is trying to say is there is no crack, no corner, no crevice, no place in the universe where God is not present, where you can get away with a deceit as if not every word from your mouth could just be started with, I swear to God. There's not a space in the universe where you can escape his watchful eye, his attentive gaze, his listening ear. Right? This is why the psalmist will say, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of hell, you're there. If I go to the far side of the sea, you're there. There is nowhere you can escape God. And only a thousand would want to. Right? There's nowhere where you're going to be able to do this in God's presence. I remember hearing a pastor tell the story of a man he was counseling who had been in rampant affairs with a mistress who was cheating on his wife. And so every time his wife would go away on business, he would have his mistress come over to the house. And that happened over and over and over again. Except as he began to confess this to a pastor, he said that his wife had this very annoying habit of putting pictures of them everywhere. Wedding pictures, family pictures. Pictures of the two of them all over the house. And so every time he would have his mistress come over, he would have to go through the same routine and just walk throughout the whole house and find the pictures of them. Now, I I don't even have to communicate to you why. You would know why. You get why. Right? Because for him, not just her presence, but even the emblem, even the token of her presence, being there while he was doing it just reminded him what he was doing wrong. And so he'd have to go throughout the whole house Turn over her picture to be able to see what he was doing. The Pharisees are essentially trying to turn over God's picture everywhere. Heaven, earth, Jerusalem, our head. And Jesus comes and says, there is no crack, no corner, no crevice, no space in the universe where you will be able to escape the watchful eye, the attentive gaze, the listening ear of your God. And so every word that comes out of your mouth might as well start with, I swear to God. Jesus is saying, listen, if you've taken my law, which was supposed to bind you to honesty, and twisted it and done enough gymnastics that now it's become for you a vehicle for deceit, I'd rather have you not take oath at all. And if that's the case, no oath at all, right, rather than suffer this. If you get that, you get what disgusts me about the Pharisees. I mean, the wicked genius that could take oaths and make it a vehicle for lies. Except, if you're honest with yourself, that's what disgusts me about myself, too. About my sin. I'm not a liar, I would say. I just spin the truth so that it's palatable to hear. And and stretch it so that it's easier to say. and, 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 And spin it just right so that it's good to hear. Right? I'm a high school student who remembers that if I wanted to go somewhere I wasn't supposed to go, before I got there, I would drive to the library and then go so that if mom asked me where I was, I could say I went to the library. Can you see that? That I'm not touching that. That's technicality, bare minimum, loophole righteousness. And Jesus says, not in my name. And so Jesus says, This is what you ought not to do, but thankfully he doesn't leave us there. Not only what Jesus is saying, but so what? What difference does it make? And look at that with me. What difference does this make? Verse 37, what should we do instead? Instead, Jesus says, and this is a wonderful verse, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. If you're not going to be marked by technicality, bare minimum righteousness, then here's what my people should be marked by. Let what you say be simply yes or no. 
Anything more than this comes from evil. Here's what he's saying. Love City Church, you belong to me. You're my disciples. You follow me. You're a part of my kingdom that I've come to establish on this earth. Then you are to be marked with such integrity and honesty that when you say yes, it means yes. And when you say no, it means no. And there's no shade and there's no gray and there's no slight stretches to any of that. Your yes simply and really means yes. And your no simply and really means no. And Jesus says anything more than that, any vows and swears and promises that are needed more than that comes from evil. Now think about that for a second. Why does he say that? He, he's essentially saying Anything more than just a yes that means yes and a no that means no comes from evil. Consider that for a second. Why do we need oaths and promises? Why do we need to say, I swear to God or I swear on my mother's grave? We say that because I really need you to believe me as opposed to all the other times where I may or may not be telling the truth. The only reason we need oaths and promises is because men are such blatantly liars. Right? That's why we need to say, I swear to When I say to you, let me be honest with you for a second. As opposed to what? All the other seconds when I'm what? Right? Because I need you to hear this moment, you can really trust me. Let me be honest with you for a second. And Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, there will be no need for such disclaimers. Because the people of mine will let their yes be yes and their no be no. There will be no need for oaths or promises. This one commentator named John Stott said, oaths and promises is just a confession that we're pathetic liars, right? Uh, my my six-year-old daughter, I have a six-year-old daughter named Hannah. I'll go to Hannah on a Saturday morning and I'll say, I'm going to take you to Chuck E. Cheese today. You know what Hannah says? Dad, do you promise? Now, at first, that just flew over my head, no problem. I, I didn't think anything of it. But as I was thinking through this, do you know what that is? That's an indictment from my six-year-old who already knows dad's yes doesn't always mean yes. Dad's no doesn't always mean no. So I got to hold him to something stronger than just yes. That's an indictment from my six-year-old that dad's yes doesn't always mean yes. And so I need something stronger than just I'll take you to Chuck E. Cheese. Dad, do you promise? And Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, in the world that I've come to create and build, my people will be marked with such honesty, integrity, that you won't near, I swear to God, or mother's graves or any of them. Their yes will be yes. Their no's will be no. Jesus envisioning that kind of community at Lofts. L listen to me. Even if you're here and you're not a Christian, if you're just checking this thing out, isn't that the world you would want? Isn't the kind of city Jesus is describing here the kind of city you wish you lived in. Don't you wish Richardson was like that? Where yeses meant yes and noes meant no. Imagine that for a second. Because this sermon is about the kingdom of God here. Right? If you remember in Matthew 4 when he starts he says the kingdom of God is at hand. It's in your face. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is just a vision of what it looks like when my kingdom breaks into a city. Into the world. And so the kingdom of God is not Loft City, just where you and I are going to fly off to when we die. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God here. You are to live out as an outpost of the kingdom of God in Richardson. And don't you wish that Richardson was marked with so many people and infiltrated and influenced the city in such a way that when yes was said here, it meant yes, and no was said here, it meant no. Isn't that the world you want? Right? Where there would be no crooked politicians. There would be nothing but honest mechanics. Right? I went to get an oil change the other week. A $16 oil change. I got, received a receipt for $261 of recommended repairs. And I can tell you, all I wanted was, brother, is your yes, yes? Does your no mean no? Right? Isn't it interesting, when you want to find a mechanic, you don't even ask about the competency of the person. You ask about their character. What do you ask? Do you know any honest mechanics? And, and Jesus is saying, I've come to build a city that if you asked, is there any honest mechanics here, the people would say, is there any other kind? A city marked with such integrity 
such honesty, a people, a community, that at Loft City Church there would be no need for oaths or vows or promises. Because when a brother says yes here, it means yes. And when a sister says no here, it means no. That's why this matters. That's why it would make a difference. What a light to the city of Richardson you would be if you would be marked by that. And that's what Jesus has called you in the Sermon on the Mount to be. A light, a city on a hill that all would see and go, something is there. We know what Jesus is saying, and we know why Jesus is saying, here's the last thing I want you to consider. What now? What, what should you do with this? Listen, the Sermon on the Mount is not a speech about how you get into the kingdom of heaven. Right? So don't leave here thinking, okay, if I make sure I never tell a lie, never lust in my heart, never get angry at anyone, I'll be in the kingdom of heaven. No, the kingdom of heaven is for liars and murderers and adulterers who are honest about it with God. Remember that the Sermon on the Mount starts with, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That is those who confess to Jesus, I am bankrupt spiritually. I don't have any resume to show you. So the kingdom of heaven is for those who are honest about their deceitful, lying lives. And who recognize that there is a good king who has died in their place for their sins. So this sermon is not how you get into the kingdom. This sermon is, what does life look like if you are a part of the kingdom? If you have repented and trusted in Christ and have been by grace alone brought into his kingdom, then Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a vision for what your life and what Loft City Church is supposed to look like. And Jesus is going to say there's two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of light and there's a kingdom of darkness. And in these kingdoms, there's two types of rulers and two types of citizens. There's the kingdom of darkness. And the ruler of that kingdom is God's enemy, the evil one, the, the devil himself. And the Bible will say he is the father of lies. So when the enemy speaks, lying is his native tongue. When the enemy lies, he's speaking his mother tongue. He's speaking his first language. And if you've ever heard the whisper of the liar, you know what that sounds like. If you've ever heard in your heart, you are unlovable. You are unforgivable. You are unclean. You are worthless. You are condemned. If you've ever heard the lisp of the liar, God can't be trusted. God won't come through. There isn't full joy in God. Then you know what the liar sounds like. And Jesus says, if your yes means no, and your no means yes, then you're living as if you belong to a different kingdom. One marked by darkness with a very wicked ruler. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, but there's a different kingdom, a kingdom of light that Jesus rules over. And in that kingdom, Jesus not only speaks truth, he is truth. Jesus in John 14 says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. Jesus is truth personified. And so when Jesus speaks, he can't help but speak the truth. Because truth is his native tongue. It's his first language. It's his mother tongue. He's incapable of lying. And Love City Church, aren't you so glad that we have a God who doesn't fib, who doesn't stretch the truth or spin, that the scriptures say God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. There's no shadow. There's no, nothing you have to worry about in God. There's no hidden thing in him. There's no shadow of deceit. Everything is pure and pure light. And so when Jesus speaks, you can trust him. So when he says to you that he loves you, when he says to you your sins are forgiven and thrown to the depths of the sea, when he says never will I leave you or forsake you, when he says I've called you, and chosen you, and I'll use you. When he says, I've died for you, when he says, I've risen, when he says he'll come again, you can believe it with all your heart because he is truth. In him is light, and there is no darkness at all. So Love City Church, here's what that means for you. If you're a liar, and we are, then you confess that even today, and you ask for the Spirit's help for transformation. And you know by grace alone you have been brought into the kingdom of light.
And if you are a citizen of the kingdom of light, then as your king is truth, then you ought to be a people marked with integrity and truth so that Love City Church would be a people where your yes means yes and your no means no. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for your wonderful word. By it, we are shown life and the way into the good life you have for us. You have not filled the scriptures with one command of prohibition after another. You have shown us the path to life that we might have fullness of life and joy evermore. We pray that even now your word would be communicated to us and the spirit would apply this word to our hearts in better ways than my mouth can. My words are puffs of air, but your spirit can come even now and take these puffs of air and drive them into our heart. Holy Spirit, would you do the work now of convicting and instructing and encouraging and admonishing and doing all that your spirit knows to do? Would you take us who are proud and make us humble? And would you take us who are humbled and in despair and elevate us as well? Would you come and show us Christ, who is the truth, the way, and the life? And let us make much of him. Come and do that, we pray.